everyone. Thank you for sticking around for a very special Ruthless Souls Q&A. My name is Leslie Sepnet, and I'm on the programming committee at the Gimli Film Festival. I'd like to welcome Madison Thomas, writer and director of Ruthless Souls, Darcy Waite, producer and voice of Jackalope, Mary Galloway, who plays Jackie, Liam Zarillo, who stars as Tony, Eugene Buffo, who plays Tay, and Stephanie Sai, who stars as Honey. And I'd like to thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to talk about the film with us, which I absolutely loved. Um, I was very touched by Jackie's story. I cried, I laughed, and I cried some more. Um, and it's just a very accomplished, character-driven story. So my first question is for Madison. Uh, what compelled you to create uh, the film? Uh, so yeah, this is uh, kind of an interesting project for me just in terms of uh, the timeline of it. Uh, a lot of my writing specifically is done very in a very condensed timeline. Like my next feature uh, I wrote in like six months. Um, so I generally write quite quickly and see a project come to fruition on that stage uh, pretty quickly. But Ruthless Souls was actually uh, in some stage of writing for about eight years. Um, wow. And it was actually kind of the culmination of two different projects that had developed kind of separately, but uh, eventually I found were very complementary to each other. Uh, one was kind of more the what evolved into the Jackie and Tony uh, relationship and exploring the kind of the grief. And the other one was uh, in its original form, kind of a love note to the Winnipeg art scene as a whole. Uh, but as I kind of folded them together, I found that I think the story I really wanted to tell was a love story to Winnipeg artists. Um, so kind of scaling it back and focusing it in more on uh, these specific characters uh, was kind of what drove that process. And uh, then we found the talent to watch uh, funding and did the last draft, uh, a little bit of a risky move in terms of I knew I wanted this group. Um, the only one missing here is Christy, uh, Toronto, who mm -hmm. played with me. Um, I knew I wanted this cast uh, from pretty early on in the development where Darcy came on as a producer. Um, and, you know, Darcy can attest to it. I was pretty heels in, driven in sand about this cast. And it was a mix of union and non-union. So it was kind of risky. And I'm, I very, I know I stressed Darcy out and our, our other producer, Hannah, a uh, lot of days. But, uh, you know, I think that was kind of a bit of the magic that was, we were able to bring to that. So I think it was worth the risk. But for any young filmmakers watching, that is a risk. Fair, fair warning. Well, it was a risk well worth it. Um, as we can see. So. And so, yeah, like Darcy and Madison, you're both um, award-winning creators and you wear uh, many different hats. Actually, you're not just producers and writers, you, you do many things. And so um, how long have you been working together and um, how, did, how did it all, all start? I'll let you take the, the handle on this on Maddie. Oh, I was, gonna hope, I was hoping you would remember that. Is it five years? I, I, well, I moved to Winnipeg 2000, January 2017. Right. Uh, so we were originally roommates first. And cool. I was working on a show in Edmonton while paying rent here in Winnipeg. And then I finally got here January. And then I think you had a, pro you just got funding for something. And you're like, I don't want to deal with the money. And you're like, do you want to do it? And I was like, sure. It was kind of, I was, I was just starting out and producing. And then you know, after that, it's just been project after project. We see an application, we're like, do you have anything? And then we just go over and, and uh, apply. So it's kind of how, and then, you know, th two years later, it was a feature, which was really cool. Yeah, no, it was uh, really fun. I think we, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Darcy, we kind of danced around working together for a while. It's so really, like, we shouldn't be roommates and work together. <laughs> like, <laughs> boundaries and, and- Boundaries, but then like Z Zazaquea, which was our first film together, a short documentary, you know, went really well and, mm -hmm. you know, got a lot of festival traction. So we're like, okay, I think we can, we can find the balance here. Yeah. Right. And so did, did you work with, like, did you all work together before previously or like, was there any, any overlap there? I, I obviously knew everyone. Mm -hmm. We had not worked together in that kind of sense, I don't think. And Liam, we knew each other from university, but I don't think we actually ever collaborated up to that point. Um, Stephanie and Mary, I were both in my web series, uh, Color of Scar Tissue, which Darcy also produced, uh, which is kind of, I always call our warm-up project to Ruthless Souls, because involved a lot of the same people and crew. 
Um, and Christy uh, had been in quite a bit of my really early indie work uh, and actually was really attached from the very first draft of one of those original projects, which was fun to bring her all, all the way through. Oh, nice. Great. And so there's a question for all of you. Um, so I really, it, it was great to see, it was more than great to see, it was like really um, imperative to see such diverse representation in, in the film as central characters, as characters who are multi-dimensional and resilient. And so if I wonder if all of you can speak to the importance of centering and prioritizing uh, these stories, especially in our current, current moment. Kids, you talk, I talk a lot. <laughs> who wants to go first? Someone? someone Mary, else? go ahead. <laughs> Damn it. Okay. Um, well, I also write and direct, and so I find it really important uh, for the stuff that I create to try and involve as much diversity as possible to make the stuff I create look like the world around us. And um, so when Madison came to me with this script, it was just like an indigenous like queer story, um, sign me up. Like, I, I don't even need to like think twice. Yes, absolutely. We need more of this in the world. And I think we're seeing that a lot uh, more these days. And um, I think it's long overdue. And yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's mandatory now. Like we're just, mm -hmm. we can't go backwards. We have to start making content that looks like the world we're in and um so yeah i think it's necessary hi yeah absolutely i think that um the the stories and the perspectives and the experiences that actually make up our cultural climate that uh you know make up the fabric of the city uh that we live in especially this being a very rooted in winnipeg story um, these experiences and perspectives and stories are, are not often the ones that we're actually seeing um, at the forefront of, of, of media and, and popular culture. And so um, I think so much uh, about um, all of us as young people. And I just think about the life-saving nature of this kind of storytelling and the importance of um, not only representation, but actual um, uh, self-determination of these kinds of communities and, and the reality that this, these stories, these, or rather these experiences and perspectives being woven into storytelling are in fact um, saving lives uh, for folks to be able to come to, uh, uh, come to a film, come to the theater and come to see themselves actively reflected um, on those screens and stages is just like so crucial um in in so far that it is actually um yeah in my opinion like desperately saving lives right yeah anyone else want to add so i am just like uh just such a fan of these people and the, this this cast that i just get lost in them talking what's the question again i just i just love listening to them talk <laughs> This happened at the Imaginative Q&A, too, y'all. Yeah, I was just like, I was I like, love oh, I, love, I love hearing them speak. I'm sorry, what's the question? Just about, um, I guess, the, uh, the importance of centering uh, stories by Indigenous, Black, LGBTQ, 2S plus uh, people. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, th that was one of the things that I, that I really just enjoyed about the, the way this story was developed was the diversity in the characters and just to begin with, right? Like, and just like my colleagues were saying here, it's something that's desperately needed. You know, when we look at um, a lot of films that have been done over the last, you know, hundreds of years, like this, this cast and the diversity on this cast, and also the diversity of point of views of looking at the same story from different angles is something that really interested me and, and, uh, and really allowed me to really connect with the story beyond just being an actor, you know, just mm -hmm. seeing uh, seeing my perspective being reflected, perspective of a black person being reflected, so perspective of an indigenous person or a trans person being reflected in the story is super important, right? Just like Liam was saying just now. So um, that off the hop, I'm just like, just like Mary said, like sign me up for anything that's diverse and, uh, and is talking about multiple perspectives that, uh, that we can all relate to as diverse people in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it's becoming a bit distracting watching um, I don't know if anyone else is having the, the same experience, but now that we're, you know, whatever, being in quarantine and, and uh, 
watching a lot of films and television shows, I'm actually finding it incredibly distracting how uh, colorless it is. And uh, I'm, I'm finding it hard to focus on anything else. And um, like everyone is saying, we need to be putting out content that actually looks like what the world looks like. How do we watch and continue to watch something that represents one race um, and then expect racism or prejudices against all kinds of people to, to not happen anymore? Um, yeah, so it's, like Liam said, it's changing lives, it's saving lives. The more uh, colorful everything is. Yeah, and I think it's not even necessarily just for diverse audience members to see themselves reflected. That is obviously so, so important and so crucial to self-esteem building and how you see yourself in the world. But it's, I think it's also really important for white audiences to see these types of stories to see these types of characters being the heroes of the story, being complex three-dimensional characters. Because I think a lot of, so much of what is happening in the world today is, you know, people are within their own communities, which are a lot of times incredibly divided. Um, you know, if you think of any suburb, it's incredibly white. Uh, some, uh, someone might not meet a person of color until they're an adult, which is a huge problem that we have to figure out. So TV and media might be some of their only windows into these worlds. Uh, so right. I think it, whether you're a diverse filmmaker or a storyteller or not, there is now a responsibility uh, to reflect these characters. Um, it's important. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and so I wanted to ask all the, the actors in the film, um, uh, you know, because I loved all of you too in, in, in the movie. I just, I'm just, uh, I'm just so in love with everyone. And I want to know how you prepared for your role uh, because your roles, you just were so genuine and so honest. And I'm wondering if any of, um, any of your real life personalities are, are enveloped in, in the roles you played. Um, let's start with, well, let's start with Stephanie. Cool. <laughs> um, oh boy. Uh, I would say that, uh, what Honey and I have in common is a sense of uh, carefreeness. And, and she's got a really beautiful uh, um, combination of being carefree and then also very caring, which I kind of, I have that combination, but they're on different levels. Um, so it was easy to connect to somebody who, who uh, uh, sees someone who might need some help and who empathizes for someone and who sympathizes for someone and, and caring about that person and then also having this kind of carefree spirit about just life in general. I think that's something I could really uh, latch onto. But other than that, uh, Honey's just way cooler than I am, so. <laughs> Not true. Not true. Not true. You're both so smooth, though. <laughs> Hold on. Honey's everything I wish I could be. But I think that's, that's what I'll say about that. Great. Um, Liam. Oh, okay. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that there are like different kinds of actors out there and, and the ones that bring themselves of themselves to uh, a character and, and, and others that really try to uh, just adopt a character to themselves. And so I really wanted to see this as an opportunity uh, to, to bring of myself to uh, a character in a life that I think already um, was so full in its creation and just so well-rounded in its writing. Um, for myself, it was the very first time in my life that I'd ever actually played my own gender. Um, in any kind of performance, whether it be on stage or on screen, um, which is a largely transformative experience and also one where I wanted to be very mindful to not, um, to still use it as, a, as an opportunity to, to uh, investigate this character and not just um, uh, sort of emulate myself um, on screen. 
And, um, and yeah, so I found what was really cool, in fact, about the experience was that in my sort of pursuit of Tony, um, I actually found myself learning and digging deeper into my own understandings and sort of ruminations on gender and on body and uh, our relationship sort of between those things and, and the manifestation of those things. And so, um, yeah, while there, of course, are going to be parallels uh, between um, uh, that experience and my own, uh, given that we are both um, trans folk, uh, I found uh, that the, um, the, yeah, the experience of exploring Tony as a character actually taught me a lot uh, about myself and actually about my own understanding of gender and my gender uh, in a way that was very, very cool. Nice. And unexpected? Totally. Yeah, I think I probably already think I know everything and I'm really smart and, uh, and like done learnings a lot of the time and I, I've just got it. And actually uh, engaging in this project and in that character in particular was a really uh, like beautiful and kind of glaring reminder that in fact my uh, gender is the journey. And my gender is the transition and the transformation as opposed to being anything that comes with any kind of end game, that it's evolution is how I identify. And yeah. so, yeah, I'm super, uh, was, was totally surprised, but very grateful um, for that sort of awakening. Rad. Yeah. Um, and Eugene. I hate having to speak after Lee. I'm like, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, no, I mean, for me, playing Tay, I mean, dancing around, barely listening and bailing on conversations when I'm no longer interested is pretty much just who I am anyways. <laughs> so that part, <laughs> that part was, uh, was just very near and dear and close to my heart and personality, right? But, uh, but at the same time, like, also having to figure out what it would be like to play a character that has a much rougher upbringing than I, than I ever had, you know, when we're, we're looking at Tay and, and the dimensions of his character and this, this, relationship or lack of relationship with with his parents specifically his dad and the fact that his family and the family that he that he clings to is mostly just his two friends that he's been with forever right and that's that's who he mostly considers family where you know again just as a person my upbringing you know, I was very close with my family right so having to find the ways to kind of go into that mindset of what it would be like to have you know what they call an, an, an absent father or someone who's been in and out of the system kind of thing and mm -hmm. and putting everything on your friends, whether good or bad, that's something I really had to try and, and, uh, and dissect and, and relate to. And, and that was really interesting. And even being able to work with this cast that also really helped me through that, right? Like, I mean, the, the scene with, uh, with, um, with, with Mary that we did uh, on the amazing sunset that we got to have, or was it sunrise? I forget which one it was. Sunrise, Anyways, uh, sunrise. <laughs> sunrise yeah. yeah, sunrise, yeah. Um, I remember me and Mary, we practiced that scene a couple times at her place and really getting to, to find that and to, to really dig much deeper than I thought I could ever dig to really find that was, was an awesome experience for me and something that I didn't know I even had, right? So that's something that I'm really grateful for this project um, doing for me as an artist is bring me to places that I didn't even know I could get to in order to connect with characters that to some degree aren't exactly like me, so yeah. Amazing, I love that scene. Cause yeah, I loved how like just that, that line you said about, you know, when your dad just got out of, um, of prison and it just, you know, just opened up a whole world of, okay, there's so much behind your character, so much history and trauma. Yeah, and that, and that he really tries to bury and hide with, with all the, the shenanigans and theatrics and, and smiling and all that, right? Which is, which is something that I think, you know, our generation and generations before, after we all kind of do to some degree, right? Which is, you know, putting on the smile when we really don't want to, or there's actually so much behind it that, that makes us not want to smile, but we try to do it anyway. And when somebody digs a little deeper and says, listen, no, for real, like you can talk to me. And then all of a sudden we break down because, you know, you've passed that wall. And now there's all this stuff that I don't want to address that I'm addressing now. Right. So that's, mm -hmm. that's something that we all kind of go through and that, that the story really addresses in all characters in some way, shape or form. So. Right. And which brings me to, to Mary, to, to, to playing Jackie, who, uh, you know, I, you made me cry so much and you know I just totally could relate to um the loss and the stages of grief um that you really played so well so if you want to maybe yeah talk about talk about playing Jackie sure yeah and also I just want to say that Jeannie that morning when we were filming that when we weren't rolling I thought I was gonna freeze to death and then as soon as <laughs> it started rolling your performance just like made me completely like forget that I was 
<laughs> so, no, the you, cold. The cold really helped us get there too, though. Honestly, well, <laughs> honestly I mean, thank also, you, though. Just logistically, you know, we were dealing with a very small budget in you know bigger budget worlds. You would have lighting that you could help that would help you keep that look and that vibe, so you could have multiple takes. We didn't have that. We were on a riverbank, and we had the window of when the sun rises. So they each had two takes on either side, and it was you know. It worked because they came in so well prepared. So I was a very fortunate director that way. They 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 made me look good in a lot of situations. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, oh, I think, made me look good. <laughs> <laughs> I think that for me, the character of Jackie, um, like really was like my opportunity to live out this side of like not giving a shit, like just like being more of a badass than I and myself am. And um, Maddie's writing was so well done and so natural that I think a lot of the scenes to me, it I didn't have to like over prepare because it I wasn't worrying about where it was going or what the words were. It just, it kind of felt like it flowed really well and that's all in the writing like the it was phenomenal so um yeah for me i like always have a different process with each character but this one i felt like i really didn't have to search too hard for it because of madison's writing it just like you could visualize it so easily off the page so for me it was all in the writing and then maddie's directing on the day it was just like okay we're good we're in good hands <laughs> You, you practiced smoking a lot, though. I did. That's one thing I really had to practice. Oh, oh so you're, an, I'm, you're a non-smoker. Okay. I've never been a yeah. smoker. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I have to speak on that, too, because that's probably the one of the, the top three stories that I tell everybody when I talk about working on this film is, again, a non-smoker and, and, and holding that for the first time in the scene where I come in and say, like, put the pliers down or whatever. And I light, I light a joint. I think it was our first take, Mary. I light the joint and whatever, do the scene. And I give it to her and then we end the scene and she's like, uh, you lit the wrong side. And I'm like, oh, for real? <laughs> like, yeah. It's just like, okay, let's try this again. Like, it's like, and I, to this day, I, yeah, and I, to this day, I still have no idea, but hopefully it looks okay on camera. <laughs> like, yeah. I didn't notice anything about it. <laughs> oh, yeah, <okay. laughs> no. Just like, even inhaling and trying to figure out how to, fi how to make it like, looks super awesome, the smoke coming out, even sometimes, like my friends have seen, they're just like, bro, what are you doing? And I'm like, listen, man, I'm in character. Like, <laughs> <laughs> my justification is that Tay's the dancer, so he wouldn't be smoking as much as the other two per se, but. Right. I'm gonna right. say that from now on. That's a good, that's a good idea. <laughs> I, made, uh, I made Christy teach Mary how to roll joints as like part of their bonding exercise. <laughs> Oh, yeah. very and nice. I was really proud of it. And then one of those scenes where I'm rolling drunk got cut, Maddie. I, <laughs> come on, <laughs> practice for that. But uh, nice. yeah, yeah, no, it was great. And um, I, I want to know. I know Madison was saying there was someone in post who was counting how many cigarettes that Jackie or things Jackie smoked. Do you remember what that number was? Because it was a lot. It was a lot. I don't remember the exact number. It was. Definitely on camera, like over 50, though. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's most scenes, if not multiple per scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that was a big part of my prep is just learning how to hold a cigarette and make it look like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> did you, did you, did you become a smoker after or? No, no, they're herbal okay. cigarettes. Like there's, there's, they're not. Oh, okay. That, those will actually discourage you from smoking. They taste so bad, to be honest. <laughs> it's essentially smoking tea. Ah, uh, well then that's yeah. okay. That's, that's totally okay. Yeah. When um, you like the wrong side, it, it tastes better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the secret all along. Um, I have a, so I have a question for uh, Liam. I just wanted to talk a little bit about your poem, Ruthless Souls, and um, um, how it, you know, this, this whole, yeah, this whole movie is a celebration of artists and especially that poem about like the power of artists and of lived experience um, and the vulnerability and courage in telling the truth. Because a lot of this film is about, about telling the truth. And I was wondering, did that, po what was the inspiration for that poem? Did it, did it, did you get write it before the film or during, or how was that process with? Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> 
So the, yeah, the, the spoken word piece was written uh, prior to shooting, um, but was uh, written once a few drafts of the, uh, of the script had already uh, kind of come through. I think maybe it was probably after draft six or seven or something like that. Um, and um, yeah, the, I mean, Madison, Madison, Maddie, Madison. Uh, <laughs> uh, very professional. Uh, very this, professional today. Right. Uh, Madison uh, was uh, very encouraging uh, to all of us to really uh, find the places where we can sort of breathe the breathe life and breathe of ourselves kind of into the, the script and the story. Um, you see that uh, Christy plays music uh, and uh, there's so much dan dancing that was uh, choreographed and of course performed by Jeannie. Um, and so uh, an opportunity for um, something that I also do, uh, which is write poetry to kind of breathe its way into the script was to create that piece. So it was certainly done in collaboration um, with Maddie. It was a really fun activity actually as a writer to um, be given sort of the parameters of like, okay, so this is kind of like the context uh, this is like the line that it sort of needs to end on and kind of start with in this mm -hmm. sense. Um, this is sort of where we're at in the story, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then sort of to take that recipe and then go and write something um, was super fun. Um, yeah, I, the sort of the inspiration from it came certainly from my own experience and what I was kind of gleaning from the character of Tony and sort of where he would have been at uh, in his own journey at that point. Um, there's a line from a, a, one of my favorite books uh, when I was growing up that goes, um, break the chains of your mind and you'll break the chains of your body too. Uh, and it always just kind of speaks to me as this like very freeing um, kind of thing to just be able to, uh, to free um, uh, your mind and your soul and what's in your hearts and to be able to sort of share that in a very uh, um, sort of powerful, I guess, kind of way. Um, and so, yeah, so that sort of concept was really what uh, found its way into the piece um, and n n in no way to, to sort of toot my own horn, but I will say my favorite line of the poem uh, and the one that was the most charged for me in, in, in reading it was the line that goes, um, you are not the temporary kill off character in this story, you are the hero. Um, and that is probably the most exciting part of the poem for me, just in that uh, it intends to communicate to anyone who hears it that, uh, that you hold just as much importance um, in, in your story and in all stories um, as, as anyone else in that, um, that you need to see that. And so, um, yeah, I think that was the question you yeah. had. I don't know. Yeah, yeah no, totally. In any case, it, yeah, it, that was sort of, you, you certainly hit the nail on the head in terms of like what uh, the crux of the poem is. Um, and yeah, that was a bit of its kind of origin story. Yeah, it was very powerful to have that like at the, near the end, you know, and, and you're addressing the audience, but also looking straight at Jackie. Yeah. I cried again, again and again, so much crying. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, have a, I have a question from Madison. So there is, there's another really like really poignant scene. There's a lot, but um, the Arlington Bridge. So I feel like Winnipeg really plays a central character um, in your film. And so for the audience members who don't know Winnipeg too well, the Arlington Bridge is this beautiful old bridge um, that connects the north end of the city to the core. And it spans this giant rail yard, which you see in the film. Um, and it's very stunning and symbolic. And I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the importance of place and landscape in your film. Yeah, totally. Um, so like a lot of my work uh, is set in Winnipeg and it very much is just kind of comes from the selfish place of I want to show my home city uh, to a lot of people just because it's a, something I don't see in media a lot. Uh, Winnipeg doubles as a ton of cities, you know, we're Minneapolis a lot, we're Chicago a lot, in a lot of films. Uh, but this has got so much uniqueness and character that I love to, you know, shine a spotlight on it. Um, and just I think in writing from a play, an authentic place. Um, like I grew up in the North End, that's, that's, that was my old stomping grounds. Everywhere you see the young versions of our character mm -hmm. running around in the flashbacks, those are all the playgrounds and the back lanes that I you know, played in. And so for me growing up in that neighborhood, the Arlington Bridge actually kind of had a very dual kind of viewpoint for me, just because on one hand it is beautiful and it is symbolic and it is something that North Enders take a lot of pride in is that bridge, but it was also actually kind of a symbol for uh, the barriers of 
growing up in the North End in terms of poverty, um, in terms of access. I didn't really have a reason to cross that bridge until I was actually going to university. Um, right. And so it was kind of a, always, I always viewed it as a point of like, you know, a bit of contention. Once I crossed it, I didn't want to necessarily go back over it. I didn't, you know, I didn't think they would let me back in to the core, or to the downtown, or to these, you know, more affluent neighborhoods if I, if I made it back to the North End. So the scene where, you know, our three friends leave their, you know, childhood characters behind, that was kind of a, a symbolic of letting that part of your childhood go. The, the traumatic parts of the growing up in those kind of neighborhoods can come with and being free to look at the beauty of it. And that's, I think, you know, when they're looking out over the North End, I think Jackie's perspective has changed on it and all their perspectives have changed on it. So that was uh, kind of that. And in terms of Winnipeg as a whole, those prairie skies, you like cinematically, it's just, it's, it's so gorgeous and uh, yeah. always love using it. Yeah, you can't beat it. And I'm, I'm just wondering what, what's everyone's connection to Winnipeg? Like, or, and maybe what, what you love about Winnipeg, what's unique about it to you? And Darcy, I want to hear this answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Darcy, you, you moved Winnipeg. here in 2017, uh, right? So. Yeah, so I'm from Alberta, uh, from Edmonton and Calgary. So uh, not a day goes by that Winnipeggers let me know that uh, I'm from the enemy territory. That's fine. <laughs> Uh, you wear the jersey, man. You, pay, you bring it on yourself. Wow, come on, man. You, how many people do you see wearing a pink Jets jersey? Is it like, come on now. Like, you got to wreck your team, right? Um, but honestly, I, like, I, I've i slowly, I mean, I'm kind of, but I, I've kind of grown to like Winnipeg. Like, it's actually a really, it's like Edmonton. Um, and, uh, you know, there people, come, people are coming out of the big cities to come here to film, right? Uh, Winnipeg, it's, it started like it's it when I first started it was doing 125 million dollars a year now it's doing like last year was its biggest year at a, hundred, at a, a quarter of a billion dollars industry right and wow. honestly I've said it all the time I say that you know without Winnipeg without the crews here without you know all the support that we have within this industry this film doesn't get made and mm -hmm. you know no. <laughs> like the, especially the scale that we were able to make it at like you know the the telefilm budget is amazing and great but it is very small and limited um so much of what we were able to put on the screen production value wise was because of the sports we had and people really rallying and helping out and that just doesn't happen in the big city no, no way so it's you know it's truly this is like a product of of uh you know of the community coming together and so you know uh, being from Alberta, would it happen there? Probably not. And so, um, yeah, that's my connection to Winnipeg. Long story short, my connection to Winnipeg. <laughs> we want them over eventually. That's great. So you're here now. You're 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 permanently here. Yeah, yeah. No, I've I I've, the company I work for has their has their claws in me. I'm not I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. Great. Anyone else? Well, that company is actually what brought me here to live. So. I was living in LA when we filmed Ruthless Souls. I came out for it. And then um, Maddie and Darcy brought me out that year earlier um, for Color of Scar Tissue. And I did a pilot episode too. So like I was working in Winnipeg for 2018, like pretty consecutively. And so then for 2019, I reached out to Eagle Vision, which is the company Maddie and Darcy work for. Um, and I was like, hey, I'm thinking of spending some more time in Winnipeg. Um, like, what do you think? And they're like, well, why don't you come work for us? So then that's sort of how I ended up here as I was a writer on a CBC show and it filmed here. So I came out for filming a year ago now, I've been here a year and uh, just haven't left. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, I'm actually originally from Montreal, Quebec and uh, I moved to Winnipeg in 2006. Um, started high school in grade 10 and pretty much just at the age of 15 or 16 just kind of restarted my life in this city so moving from a big what they would call a big city to to whatever they call Winnipeg which is just awesome anyways right um but I remember um my first day when I landed and I I was walking out of the airport and the first thing I saw was the license plate the license plate just says friendly Manitoba and I remember just saying out loud to myself like wow okay calm down it's a little pretentious friendly <laughs> Manitoba and then some woman just walked by and she was like, oh, you must be new here. Don't worry, you'll see. Have a great day. And she walked off and I'm like, wait, what? Like <laughs> people just randomly talk to you here. Like being from Quebec, that just, that just doesn't happen, right? So, uh, so I kind of actually just fell in love with the city right then and there. I'm just like, 
uh, just like we were saying, the way the film gets made is, is people really helping each other out and, and being there for each other and through whatever sacrifice of their own in order to help somebody else succeed. Like you'll see that here in Winnipeg and in all different industries and all different walks of life, right? Where um, being from Montreal, spending lots of time in Toronto and Vancouver, it's very hard to come across those kind of those kind of personalities or those kind of like work ethics to just kind of help each other, right? So that's that's the biggest thing that you get from Winnipeg. People will move to bigger cities and then they'll come back and they'll just say because they miss the people because they're really the people that make this kind of city work. And that's what makes the film work because it's the people that get involved behind it, right? So uh, even regardless of being from Montreal, I'm, I'm also here to stay because it's just, it's just great here. It's friendly. So there you go. Nice. Wow. Uh, yeah, no, I'm actually uh, originally from uh, Winnipeg. Um, and uh, <laughs> you didn't know what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Plot twist. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, born and raised uh, here. I was in like, I'm like 90% sure of this answer, but the delivery, <laughs> it's really Liam. Uh, I was like, what? <laughs> uh, and yeah, I, there's so much that I love about this city. I've always um, just like felt so, so rooted and so grounded here. Um, I consider this place to be just a very sort of small town in a, in a comparatively big city. Um, in that it's, it's sense of community is really strong uh, in a lot of ways. Um, I was even just like walking home I, about an hour before doing this. I went to uh, a little market down the street and got some veggies. And on my way home, uh, an old man I'd never met just like popped out of his house and asked if I was gonna eat the tops of my beets. And uh, I wasn't planning to, so he said, okay, I'll be right back. I'm gonna get a knife and some money. And I said, okay, we'll just get the knife. And then I thought that was maybe a strange thing to say, but he ran inside and grabbed a knife and just like chopped off the tops of uh, my beets. And, and now I have a new friend named Raymond Potter who lives just down the street. Classic uh, Raymond. And told uh, myself and my partner that we uh, are as slick, slicker than a cucumber and an apple. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know if that's like great at articulating uh, Winnipeg and, uh, as, a, as a whole, <laughs> but it certainly was a, an experience that can be found here in a, a place that is, you know, at, still at 800,000, you know, people, uh, roughly, um, is, uh, yeah, which is a, a really, really special thing, I think. Or quirky. <laughs> yeah, or super strange and maybe not what you want at all. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you like the tops of your beads. I'm not sure. Anything to add, Stephanie? You're muted. Oh, you're on mute. Damn it. I, uh, I, I just said I'm born and raised in Winnipeg. And um, yeah, I'm, I, I've been thinking about this question a lot, actually, uh, before even uh, this question was brought up here about what makes me proud to be a part of this community. And uh, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why, but I think I've narrowed it down to maybe not just this one thing, but I, I think the talent in Winnipeg is always, um, for lack of a better word, unexpected. I think that we're, we're underdogs and, and, you know, it might sound insulting when someone says, oh, you're local or, um, oh, you're from Winnipeg or, or, or that person's from Winnipeg. Um, you know, there's a way to take that so that it might sound insulting, but I'm always really um, proud of when that happens. And I think that our talent pool in Winnipeg and that, you know, that includes our producers, our directors, our, our crew, our, every you know talented person in Winnipeg there's so so many of us and I am so incredibly proud to say I'm a part of that community um and we all work really really hard and uh yeah and I think it's like the you know the the like small the like the just the trying to, we we have a lot we have a lot to prove and uh and um I don't think we ever really disappoint. So I'm real. I'm just. I'm just proud to be living here and to have stayed here and to have committed myself to being here. Because time and time again, like I forget that Darcy, you're not. You're not originally. You weren't born here. Jeannie, you weren't. Mary, it's like I forget about that. I was born in Brandon. 
Yeah. Oh, okay, so you were. Oh, cool. I'm a Manitoban. <laughs> I'm technically technically a Manitoban, <laughs> mm -hmm. but raised in Alberta, so it's kind of technically technically, but more. No, no, more, no. Doesn't there. count. Doesn't yeah. count. Winnipeg, Winnipeg. Just kidding, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I'm always reminded of how great um, the city is when, when people that are not from here come here. Yeah, and like, you know, speaking of which, like Darcy and Madison, you, you touched it, upon it a little bit, the, um, the Telefilm Talent to Watch funding, which congratulations, like, it's very competitive and that uh, Ruthless Souls got that funding. Um, and do you want to speak about that a little bit more about like the application process or like how, how it did help or maybe, you know, yeah, a little bit more about that. My memory of the application process is just chaos just because we were applying for this while we were shooting the web series. Okay. Yeah. So that my, all my memories are just up us at like midnight kind of doing the application. <laughs> I'm not giving up my producer tricks. No, I'm totally kidding. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, no, honestly, it was um, because me and Maddie have gone through the process of applying for grants and stuff like for the year before, it really kind of set us up to be ready to apply for um, ta the, the talent to watch, which happens in January. Uh, so we applied the first time to the nominator. They nominated us, um, you know, and thank you, NSI. And then we were also, so while we were shooting our web series, um, Color of Scarlet, so me and Maddie would spend like, 10 hours on set filming a show and then we'd go home Maddie would watch footage and I would start the application and then we'd finish so we were doing like what was it, like 16 18 hour days yeah. and then um and you know so thankfully um the second phase of applications telefilm awarded us the uh the funds but um it for for applications like that it seems so daunting at first when you're when you're a young filmmaker when you're kind of watching this you're like I don't even know where to start mm -hmm. But everyone goes through that. Everyone, it happens to everybody, right? And so all you have to do is just, is just take it one step at a time. You know, you take, you take the checklist and you, okay, what's the first thing? Boom, do that. What's the second thing? Boom, do that. And then, you know, give yourself a lot. Don't try to do it at night. But, you know, over time, you can get it done in a month, you know, if you have the script ready to go. Um, but, and that's through everything, right? That's the Canadian system. Our Canadian system is based on applications. And so... You know, it's, that's how you get funding. That's how you make movies is through applications. Totally. And I mean, also like depending like for telephone specifically, depending on what stream you're in, like we uh, got awarded our grant through the indigenous stream, which is a separate pool of money. Um, and that stream has its own like dedicated advisor, Adam Garnett Jones, um, yes. who's phenomenal and will, is available to answer your questions at any time. So, you know, they, they do, the applications do seem like super daunting at first, but um, there's people to help you for the parts that are confusing or don't make sense and but yeah uh, make a really good sizzle video that's uh, definitely a thing that we've learned over the years. Nice. Yeah. No go ahead Darcy do you have anything else to add? Oh no just yeah sizzles um, and yeah so I didn't have like because it's the indigenous one too like our money was a little bit we have less money for okay. the indigenous stream than the regular because that comes out of a different pot. Okay. And so it's kind of, yeah, once you get into the telephone system, you learn like all, like everything, right? And so it's super important to go to market as a producer or as a filmmaker, it's just super important to go to markets because then you, then you know what's happening in the world of, of Canadian film. And then you can kind of make those connections like Adam Gardner Jones, NSI, On Screen Manitoba, and, and, and it's easier to get nominated that way. Mm. And so I do have, I do have a, a final question um, for everybody. Um, you know, for, yeah, for young creators out there um, who, who want to tell stories like this that are very honest and um, that are stories about survival and resilience um, and important stories, um, what, what advice do you have for them? Like, you know, because it's not, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. Um, you know, there's a lot of blowback. And I'm just wondering what, what motivated you? What, what would you tell a young person who, who maybe a bit scared about continuing even. I don't know who you're pointing at, Darcy. Matt <laughs> <laughs> uh, first. You kinda... Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, like, it, it, it can be incredibly difficult, specifically if you're looking to tell a story that necessarily hasn't been told uh, before or hasn't been told 
a lot, um, which I think this, this film kind of represents in terms of the communities it represents and the, also the storytelling style itself. It's, you know, a nonlinear film. Um, it has art house elements to it. Um, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, connect, connect the dots uh, film. And so these are harder to sell, you know, our market is more limited. So I, I think it's really important to understand as a young person, what kind of films you want to make. Um, and understand that those might not be the ones that are the easiest to sell and get greenlit. Uh, so you just have to find ways to, you know, make your stories exciting. It's all about that pitch at the end of the day, you know, uh, before the cameras are rolling or before you get to cast or before you get to do any of that fun stuff of filmmaking, there's the gr excruciating part of pitching um, and trying to convince other people to support your story. And so I would say just don't give up if it's um, a story that you're passionate about telling. Um, and, you know, if you don't see yourself represented on screen, change that. Awesome. Yeah, it's, it's hard. This, it's, this industry is, is hard, you know, it's, and it's hard at every level, right? Like, and you can't do it alone. Like, you can't be a film tour where you're like, I'm the writer, director, producer, editor, I'm gonna sell this film. Like, you need a team. And Unless you need you're Maddie, people. then you can do that. <laughs> well, well that's the thing though I didn't produce at all of this really <laughs> but like no but like even if your team is small that team is super important like mm -hmm. if you you really can't like I would have sucked as a director if Darcy and Hannah were not doing all their that great job behind the scenes yeah and it's you know it's it's you know when it's tough you have those people who go through that with you and that's the important thing right it's like because like I always say, you can't do this alone or you're a vlogger, I guess. Um, <laughs> not nothing against vloggers, it's just, you know, <laughs> not your film, so, you know. <laughs> vloggers getting straight bullets, no? I, no, no, no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, trolls, so I'm out. <laughs> I, uh, I have a, a mentor and like a colleague and a dramaturg that I've worked with a lot in theater. And, and one thing that she'll say when we're working on uh, working on stories and, and it was, yeah, one of the first uh, projects of uh, mine that she worked as a, a dramaturg on, which is kind of like a helpful, uh, an editor, like more than helpful editor. It's a kind of a tough job to articulate, but it's crucial. And she, uh, uh, she asked the question and says that she often, she'll always ask the question when working and I've kind of adopted this sort of, uh, this kind of mantra is um, just like sort of asking yourself, like, what is this play or what is the stories uh, what is this film's gift to the world? And I think if you can answer that question, if there is an answer to that question, then then just do it. Then it's certainly worth it. Nice. Well, I would say I have a couple, I have many pieces of advice, um, but the two that I'll like focus on right now is the first thing is to look at what you want to pursue and, and question if, you were to do something else, would you still be happy? And if the answer is yes, then go do something else. But if the answer is no, and you absolutely feel in your heart that you need to be a filmmaker, you need to be a writer, director, actor, whatever it is, this goes for anything. Um, if you need that to feel fulfilled, then work your ass off. Don't, um, don't sit back and wait for things to happen for you. You have to actively um, work on your skill set. You have to network um, and you have to build the confidence to just go for it. And um, basically, yeah, just don't give up. The people who, who don't succeed at it are the people who give up. So just don't give up and one day you'll get to where you want to be. Yeah, that's great. Um, something that I tell myself that I, even as a as a dancer actor, like I, I'm always um, pursuing fun. Like I'm just chasing fun wherever I go, right? Like, um, and the reason for that is even is when I when I think about it that way, even when like Darcy was saying, even when it gets its hardest, and there's some days where you're like, why am I even doing this? Like, if at the end of the day I know that there's there's still fun on the other side of that Arlington Bridge, then I'm gonna pursue it no matter what, right? So um that's probably like the biggest thing i could say because when it comes to other specific advice things for me i'm just like as an actor or just as an artist there's a lot of just like wtf days kind of thing right where you're just like uh okay <laughs> right like in a lot of moments where 
you know, you get, you get kind of like sidetracked or, or a uh, squirrel over there or kind of thing. Right. Or just like moments where you like, you, you actually don't know what you're doing. And if any of us could say to someone how we ended up in the position that we ended up in, it's back to what Mary was saying. Like we worked our ass off to get to this point and we had fun doing it. Right. And not only people that don't get to where they want to go, like are people who give up, but also those people that stopped having fun trying to pursue that thing. And then if it's not fun, then you bounce kind of thing, right? So for me, my concept is simple. It's just like, where is the most fun with hard work and all the blood, sweat and tears. But if I can, if I know that on the other side, there's going to be at least an iota of fun, like I'll stick around, you know what I'm saying? So that's kind of my whole big thing is, is it fun? Do you want to have fun? And it is there fun. And if the answer is yes, then go have fun. Right? Yeah. Just like Liam would say, you know? <laughs> Um, oh boy, um, these are all great. Uh, I will listen to these things. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think lately it's, it's more, um, I think asking questions is really important. Um, you know, why projects are being made, uh, why you want to be a part of that project, and um, thinking more about people than projects too. I think if you can get behind the person, you can get behind anything that happens with the project too, right? So kind of piggybacking on what Darcy said, it's like you find the right people to work with and then everything else will be fulfilling if you already take it seriously and are trying to improve. You surround yourself with smart, intelligent, talented, kind people and by through osmosis you will just naturally feed on that energy which is what happened in this project and and why like i speak for myself and i think for most of everyone on this project it was so satisfying and so fun and so freeing and so just everything a project you want it everything you want in a project this was and also the outcome of it, uh, me personally, I don't think I've ever felt more on set anyway. I mean, since then I feel more comfortable, but I think a Ruthless Soul had a lot to do with um, my growth uh, as, a, as a performer in film. And it was because I was introduced to this way of doing things where I love every single person and uh, I could, get behind the project and the people. Yeah. Amazing, and it, oh, go ahead, Darcy. Hey, Steph, weren't you filming on another show while we're, while we're shooting Ruthless? Like, I'm 90% sure you come from that set to our set. It was doing a theater show. Yes, that was it. Yeah. That was crazy, I'm still blown away by that. Yeah, we still don't quite understand how that happened, but. We like, home to bed. Like that, you know. But we're very, we're very glad that our set was a, was a good environment that way. For the okay. It totally re like permeated in like as a viewer watching it, you know, it was just so authentic and, and lovely. And I just want to congratulate you all on such an accomplished work. And we all can't wait to see what else you're up to next. Um, and so I just wanted to thank you. And if there's any final words uh, that you want to say to our, our en engaged viewers. Thanks for watching, and we're really happy to be at the Gimli Film Festival. Yes, well, thank you, Madison, Darcy, Mary, Liam, Eugene, and Stephanie, and to all of our viewers. Um, and so check out the rest of our lineup at GimliFilm.com. And yeah, have yourselves a great evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Peace, peace. Let's go have fun. <laughs>